The just defense theory as formulated by St. Augustine addresses two questions. First, jus ad bellum, under what circumstances is going to war right, moral, and just? Under what circumstances is it morally justifiable for a Christian to participate? Second, jus in bello, what conduct is right and moral during wartime? Once violence, killing, and war have begun, what is permissible and what is not? What, if anything, might turn what began as a just war into an unjust war? St. Augustine and later tradition present us with seven criteria or standards for a just war. The first criterion or standard, the cause must be just. A real and certain injustice must exist. Some aggressor is endangering innocent lives or other basic human rights. For that reason, as we have seen, the just war theory rules out preemptive strikes and so-called preventative war. The cause must be just. That is, the real goal must be the protection of human life and other basic rights and the restoration of justice and peace. The second criteria or standard, there must be right intention. True justice and the restoration of peace must be and must remain the desired outcome. For that reason, the just defense theory rules out some common reasons nations go to war, gaining and maintaining control of another nation's territory or resources, seeking revenge for past harm, to humiliate a rival government in the eyes of its citizens in the world, the killing of as many of the enemy as possible, going to war with Nation A in order to send a warning signal to Nation B, protecting foreign investments. Criterion 3. The decision to go to war, to engage in violence and killing, must be made by the nation's legitimate authority. In the past, that usually meant a country's prince or king. St. Augustine seems to have assumed the legitimate authority would be a Christian ruler who would take the church's understanding of just and unjust wars seriously. In the United States, the legitimate constitutional authority is Congress, and, in some circumstances, the President. Note that this criteria stipulates that legitimate authorities are those that obey existing treaties regarding the conduct of war, such as the Hague Conventions and the Geneva Conventions. These treaties rule out genocide, ethnic cleansing, torture of captured soldiers, and the use of weapons whose effects cannot be controlled, such as nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. This criteria, by the way, raises an interesting issue. Since no war is just unless declared by a legitimate authority, can there ever be a just revolution? If so, who is the legitimate authority who would declare such a war? Just Defense Theory Criterion 4, sometimes called practical pacifism, this standard says that no war is just unless it is the last resort. Before turning to violence, killing, and war, all nonviolent means of resolving the conflict and restoring justice must have been tried and shown to be ineffective. Negotiation, mediation, legal action in the World Court or the United Nations, blockade, non-cooperation, civil disobedience, and other nonviolent tactics must have been tried and found unsuccessful. Until then, violence, killing, and war remain unjust and immoral. And should nonviolent tactics fail, only the minimum amount of violence necessary to restore justice and peace is permissible. Criterion number five. No war is just unless there is a reasonable chance of success. There must be good, sound reasons for believing that violence, killing, and war will achieve the desired goal. Justice, the protection of the lives and rights of the innocent, and the restoration of peace. All suicidal attacks say Cuba going to war against Russia. Those are ruled out by this standard. If all of these first five criteria, just cause, right intention, legitimate authority, last resort, and reasonable chance of success, if all are met, then violence, killing, and war could be considered just, legitimate, and moral, and thus a Christian might participate. Okay, all five criteria have been met, and a just war has now begun. It doesn't end there. The just defense theory maintains that a war may cease to be just unless certain other criteria or standards concerning the conduct of the war are met. We turn to those now. Criterion 6, Proportionality. This criterion is a reminder that no war remains just unless the good achieved by the use of violence and killing outweighs the harm done. Wars are costly, costly in human lives and suffering and in national resources. Does the good achieved by going to war outweigh the cost in lives, suffering, and resources? 
In simplistic terms, it is never morally permissible to kill 1,000 people in order to save 100. Proportionality says there has to be a balance. The just defense tradition rejects the idea that anything goes in time of war. When a war becomes disproportionate, when the evil caused begins to outweigh the good to be achieved, the war ceases to be just. This raises an important question one St. Augustine could never have imagined. Can the use of nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons ever be moral? Finally, Criterion 7, non-combatant immunity. A non-combatant is any person who is not involved in the manufacture, direction, or use of weapons during wartime. This criterion demands that non-combatants must never be targeted or attacked. It also forbids the destruction of the enemy's infrastructure, his water and sanitation systems, power plants, hospitals, crops and food reserves, and so on, because doing so is an attack on non-combatants. Indeed, the magisterium of the church has actually excommunicated such attacks. In the words of the fathers of the Second Vatican Council, any act of war directed to the indiscriminate destruction of whole cities or vast areas with their inhabitants is a crime against God and humanity which merits firm and unequivocal condemnation. In the Church's theological jargon, this is the language of excommunication. The only person or thing excommunicated by the Second Vatican Council was an action the deliberate killing of civilians. In the 20th and 21st centuries, as we shall see later in this presentation, non-combatant immunity has become a crisis. So a war that begins as a just war may or may not remain just. Civilians and the infrastructures that sustain them must be protected and not attacked, and the damage done to both sides must remain proportionate. Just cause alone does not make a war just. It is worth noting that St. Augustine himself never claimed that any war could ever meet all seven of the criteria. To return to the question raised at the start of this presentation, when is it morally justified for my opponent to use violence killing in war against me and my nation? Catholics in the pacifist tradition say never. Catholics who adhere to the just defense tradition say only when all seven of the theory standards have been satisfied. And, of course, the same goes for me and my nation. Contrary to the view of a few neoconservative American Catholics, like Michael Novak and George Weigel, the just defense theory's presumption is against war. It assumes that violence killing and war are wrong. It places the burden of proof not on those who say war is evil and who claim it is immoral for a Christian to participate. No, the burden of proof is on the one who claims This particular war is an exception to the rule. In this particular case, all seven of the just defense theory's criteria have been met. People often assume the opposite, that one should cooperate and participate in the nation's wars, and that the burden of proof rests on those who refuse. Note, too, that according to the logic of the just defense theory, war is at best a regrettable, necessary evil, never a cause for celebration. Indeed, there were times in centuries past when Christian soldiers returning home from even a just war were required to do three years' penance before they could receive the Eucharist because they had engaged in killing. Even a victory in a just war was an occasion for mourning. In 1993, the U.S. Catholic bishops, in their pastoral letter, The Harvest of Justice is Sown in Peace, summarized Catholic just defense teaching this way. One, In situations of conflict, our constant commitment ought to be, as far as possible, to strive for justice through nonviolent means. And two, but when sustained attempts at nonviolent action fail to protect the innocent against fundamental injustice, then legitimate political authorities are permitted, as a last resort, to employ limited force to rescue the innocent and establish justice. So, according to Catholic teaching, A Catholic Christian with a well-formed Christian conscience may hold one of two positions regarding violence, killing, and war. Either the pacifist position or the just defense position. Absolute militarism is ruled out. 